Greetings. Hi, Max here. Yes, I remember you. Thank you. Now I learned more about you. You know more about me? I read more and uh, your name comes up. That's Hermes Trismagistus. Very well. Uh, we discussed the uh, DNA and um, uh, the, the development of the theory about its um, resonation. Yes. So I wanted to continue that conversation if possible. Where did we leave off? Um, I moved forward in thinking. Uh, we left discussing possibly the involvement of the new neuronal code and linkage of it to um, uh, DNA code. Yes. So how do neurons and DNA resonate? Oh, and, yeah. And now, and now I'm moving towards the actual analysis of the sequences. So we, we look at the genome, actually multiple genomes, from uh, very primitive to to human, and looking for uh, sequences within it. There and, are millions. Uh, again? There are millions of sequences, but right. at the base there are there are some basic ones, but uh, there are millions of sequences when they are complete. Right. So, um, you understand what I mean? Um, complete, of course. So, um, the idea is that for uh, different sequences can resonate with each other if they have different sequence. Oh, yes, but uh, they can resonate if they have the same pattern of, uh, of, um, uh, they have similar structure of molecules. Oh, and yes. and um, one of the most primitive structures is, uh, primitive understandings is that purines are different from pyrimidines. Purines have two rings, <laughs> two rings and <coughs> pyrimidines have one ring. So, so it doesn't really matter what, if it is, uh, uh, Purine A or G, it still is a Turing purine. So, so we're simplifying the sequence and looking between, uh, looking for similar simplified patterns. Yes. Well, and there are some simplified patterns, but uh, I'm not sure of what, where you're looking uh, exactly, because you can see patterns in just about every place that you look, the thing is, the patterns that you're looking for are the basic uh, patterns that send messages to neurons? We are now, st we stepped away from neurons. We are just looking at the sequences. No. I just see. looking for patterns within the genome, forget, forget, forgetting everything else. I mean, not forgetting, but discarding and ignoring everything. A C G D and that that so so we just uh, forget about distinction between A and G because it is the same Turing structure and it has little minor my minor differences but the fact that it is two rings uh, we kind of highlight the fact that it is two rings and then we just imagine it simplified to A G one letter and CT in other letters. So it's, yeah. it's much more simple. It's like zero, zeros and ones. It becomes uh, binary. binary. Yes, yes, uh -huh. it can become binary. Yes. And now we yeah. look at that. Uh, the, and now, now we look at that simplified pattern. So if you look at it in that simplified pattern, then you're going to have to look at the, uh, what these uh, the binary system is doing. And the the algorithm or the um, the number that it's trying to represent, and that number it co coincides with the parts of the body and the brain. 
And so uh, you have your zeros and ones, but your energy release is for different parts of the body and brain. Right. I mean, they, they, we keep that in mind, but at the moment, the focus is just to prove that there is resonance. And um, so far, we don't have... Haven't they already proven no, that? Not on, the, not on DNA level. There is nothing yeah. on DNA level. Oh, they have not proven the resonance yet? On the DNA level, no. I mean, there is resonance in Reiki and some other resonances, but not for DNA. DNA is still innocent. We need to uh, some proof that the resonance resonance is there. Well, and everything everything works with resonances. And it's just the fact when you do any study of anything, uh, there is a resonance and, and a vibration that uh, is part of it. And so they, I am surprised that that has not been discovered because it's very basic. Um, it's the resonance has to be there in order for the information to to pass. A charge or a resonance of some sort must be uh, evident. Have they discovered that there is perhaps an electrical charge between them? Oh yeah, I mean people believe there is resonance, but they ignore the fact that there could be sequence specific resonance of biological importance. Oh yes, there is, absolutely. So, to just to have some proof, I think that's the easiest way to prove it, is to find two sequences in a genome which have different primary sequence. So A, G, C, T, when you have four letters, four letter sequence would be different. But if you simplify two, two letters, zero, one, if you simplify and find that they're identical, then it proves that they can resonate on purine pyrimidine level. Correct. And when the, you will find that resonance, the, the reason why the DNA is set up the way it is, is so that it can move in, in that kind of a sequence, kind of the, the binary sequence, so that it can actually uh, duplicate itself a, as it bends around. Does, and a, it's uh, in contact with other uh, areas of the DNA. When there is a signal sent, that, that particular resonance is copied many times. Uh, right. So, so far we didn't find any, uh, I call them uh, homology, homological uh, resonance sequences. We, uh, I define them that the primary sequence is different, but simplified sequence is identical. And so far, we didn't find any any pairs like that. I mean, all the pairs we find are imperfect. They have large imperfections. They um, are not that similar. They're not statistically surprising. They could be happening by chance. So that's where we are at the moment. Are you looking for sequences that are next to one another? No, we look everywhere. Because the, these sequences will not be next to one. They will be identical, but they will not be next to one another. They will be in the, in the circuitry, but they have to duplicate themselves to get the message across correctly. So therefore, you're going to find that... Uh, they are going to be a, a little different when you're looking at those that are around them because those are not the where the sequence is going. The sequence right. is moving over those. Mm -hmm. And they're going into, uh, they're skipping some of the, the links, if you will. Right, right. And yeah, we assume there will be some distance, but I also assume there would be like, uh, frequently happening, like uh, some some typical uh, chorus, as as I call them, yes, chronological uh, resonance sequences, yes, uh, or recorded but, sequences. Yeah. But in order to see those actual sequences, you're going to have to look at the whole uh, 
sequence the or the whole line of yeah. information. I mean, we, so far we were just okay. looking at, at million letters, but not at the whole genome, which is billions of letters. So yes, you're going to have to look at more than what you're looking at at the moment. All right. You're going to have to look a little farther ahead to mm -hmm. see that they skip over and do um, asymmetric sequences, but yet they're identical. When, when they're doing their asymmetric sequence, they are still identical in the way they do it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right, right. That's so, the idea. Uh -huh. They are not a symmetrical sequence. They are asymmetrical. So you're going to have to look at it, at it a little differently than you, the way that you're looking at it now, and and you will see that there are some that are exactly the same, but they are not in a symmetrical sequence. They, have, but the, it is the exact same resonance and the exact same um, binary code that is moved to a different place and is, is taking right. sequence higher and higher to, to the place that it needs to go. But it jumps over some of the other ones because they are not part of the actual sequence that is necessary, at least for that time. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have a lot of abstract sequences, but with a identical a a g or whatever you want to call it your your identical a g's will be exactly the same but they will not be in a symmetrical sequence all right so thank you so that's where we are we're still looking we developed the programs to look at bigger chunks yes you need to look at a bigger section of a vibrational movement, a bigger section of the code to uh -huh. see the pattern. Then you will see the pattern because it does, it can skip for quite a ways uh, some of these sequences. Uh, you need to find one of the sequences that are very close together. That may be harder to do, but they do exist, but they're probably very, very basic uh, they have a very, very, very basic message, and they're not ad at all advanced in what they're doing or the message that they're sending, such as, uh, well, that that's not, mm, let's see. Looking for when someone is breathing, there will be a very basic uh, code for that because it's a constant it will but it, you may not even see it because it's just going back and forth All right it will be moving very uh, very it, it will seem like it's not hardly even a sequence it's moving so so very such a short distance but there's so many of them moving that short distance that if you can see it exactly the way it is it would be like a code for breathing or one mm -hmm. of the uh, systems that is very automatic and has to be done consistently. And those codes hardly seem like they're moving, hardly seem like a sequence at all, yet they're there. And the reason why they don't seem like hardly a sequence at all is because they are so, they're made to be in constant movement. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, so one of the ideas was uh, we have a, a, a choice which genomes, which uh, species to look at. And uh, I wonder that possibly there are some uh, species of life which are um, have more of the this kind of resonant sequences, which are called choruses, uh, homologically recorded sequences. So, uh, so um, one of the ideas is that maybe insects have more of those? Uh, they have more of those because they everything is instinctive and moves without a thought process. Huh. Right. So, so I'm, I'm, you know, we have genomes of mushrooms, uh, insects, yes, all other know. vertebrates, and uh, some of the fish. So, so we, we have a choice where to look for those. 
Yes, be, they have no thought process behind them. They're just uh, instinctive kind of uh, things, like I was saying about the breathing and things of that nature. But uh, yes, with insects and animals that are not using intellect to make, to, uh, to uh, do anything, basically, they're doing choosing instinct and just physiology, basically, uh, there will be more of those. I was also thinking that some of the animals are collective, so they would have sequences for collective behavior to unite them into a pack and a school. Yes, there are some, there are some like bees and hive collective thought processes uh -huh. which connect, which uh, part of their system is telepathy in some ways because mm -hmm. when a part of their uh, DNA uh, is selected to for a sequence, other uh, bees are in that sequence of, of DNA. It's not just their own. They're in uh, the hive uh, mentality. And so when that, when that sequence starts, it goes through the hive. Right. Yes, that is correct. So I was hoping that, you know, comparing a cat and a dog would uh, show the difference because dogs seem to be a pack animal and cats seem to be individuals. Yes, dogs would have more of that, more of the tele telepathy kind of thing. They have since evolved, they're evolving away from it at this point. But at one point it was very, uh, very, they had a very telepathic system where certain um, secretions of uh, certain, certain glandular secretions could send actual messages one to the other. Fear or be alert or there's food ahead or whatever it is, different kinds of, uh, of secretions and mental uh, movements can actually uh, trigger uh, thought processes within uh, group uh, thought processes. I also uh, listened yesterday to uh, Helena Blavatsky and she mentioned that snakes uh, possibly have the ability of, um, especially cobras, the ability to hypnotize people. So I wonder if they have some sort of special sequences for that. It's, um, what it is, this is going to be quite interesting, but they do have a psychic kind of uh, way of interacting with their prey. Um, they calm their prey down by looking directly into their eyes, and then, um, then they attack. Right. So I wonder if they do it through genomic resonance. There is a genom genomic re resonance in, in a very, uh, what, what would you say? A very prehistoric kind of thought process, a very primitive thought process. Right. It's a very primitive uh, thing. It goes back millions of years from when things were um, uh, like amoeba, uh, when they... Uh would separate, the separated amoeba would still be one thought process in, in the sense that they, they came from one place, they are now two, but yet they are still communicating as one. So it's right. very primitive, that's a very primitive uh, connection, but yet it, it is something that has uh, pro proliferated throughout billions of years. So they have to tune into the frequency of the victim, and usually they hunt uh, rodents, so there should be some similar sequences between rodents and uh, snakes. There is. There is similar sequences between um, Every uh, link in the in the uh, the chain of the food chain, and uh -huh. 
uh, it is because that that's just the way it is. There is uh, primal connections between all of them, and they know the difference between a harmful and a safe animal for the most part. And that's why you see sometimes that uh, animals in the wild start to become very friendly with humans, especially like pigeons or things of this nature that come around. Uh, after a while, they realize what the uh, sequence of the thought process is, and they are no longer afraid. They uh -huh. connect to the situation, if you will. Uh-huh, uh-huh. This happens down through time. And it happens in the food chain a lot. And that, uh, I'm not sure where I'm going with this because you can go several directions from there. Yeah, I'm still looking for resonance sequences. Um, one of the directions where I was um, researching was um, practical application of those. Uh, and um, one of the great... Um, applications is to to do um, to improve uh, therapy and uh, to direct how the body grows so and for that we we'll, we can look at the embryos and we can see that it's uh, like I was looking at the development of the f I think it was a frog or a fly or fish embryo fish embryo um, the video and uh, at some point, uh, the part which I think will become maybe the head or the gut or the same thing, it was just starting, started moving inside. Uh, there was a mass of cells, and that part started diving inside of the mass of cells, like it was uh, attracted, uh, as if it was attracted some, by some force. So there was a, a hole, a deep um, emerging in, in a big mass of cells. So I wonder uh, where do the forces come from and how do the sequences, I, how, how, the, how does the resonance happen there? It's the catalyst for growth. The, there is a part of all beginnings of life that has the leadership ability, if you will. And they mm -hmm. will take charge of the situation and go where they need to go to bring the energy and to bring the uh, the certain uh, DNA codes that are necessary for growth. Yeah, so the DNA is linear and somehow it happened to uh, direct the three-dimensional structure. So initially the uh, uh, it looks like there are morphogenes. It's called uh, pieces of DNA uh, responsible for creation of the head, of the tail, and um, some of the parts of the body. And so they are surprisingly, I mean, I'm not surprising, they are in the sequence. So the head is first and the tail is last. And this morphogen, I think they're called Hox genes, they go one after another. Yes. So that makes sense. But then at some point, uh, there is a branching and there is a hand growing out of the a certain part of the body, like shoulder part of the body. And again, the hand has a sequence, so there is like a beginning of the hand and the end of the hand. I don't know if those morphogenes are found for the sequence of the hand, but my question is how, the branch, how does the branching happen? Because branching is a, going from, two, from one dimension to two dimensions. Well, it's the same as how does a seed how does a seed grow as well so it it comes from uh the inner the workings of the inner parts of the being and it has a sequence and it has it is already set up ahead of time so that it's it it comes at the proper time that's what dna does it is it is put in there to develop it's uh, it the parts of the body at, the, at certain times. And this is like the time-released um, sequence of the DNA. And that is inherent, the 
from the very beginning uh, with uh, with the zygote, the, with the sperm and the egg or whatever it is that however it starts, that is the beginning mechanism of it and it has all the information right there so one of the questions is um, uh, who decides which part of the of the body decide to grow the hair is it the cells which grow the hair they decide or the the rest of the body tell them to do that I mean no it's it's the cells the um, it is inherent within the cells what is going to happen with the growth of this particular being or body. They are they have their own information and they do they are told within the realms of the uh, way that the body is set up. Yeah, sometimes we see that some of the cells they start at one place and then they actively drive or move to another place. So they seem yes. to have to know the way within the body. And if they want to grow the hair, they possibly, the stem cells, they possibly start in one place and they move to another place, make yeah. a colony there and start constructing it. So right. how do they know where they are? Uh, it's instinctive. It's just, um, well, let me put it another way. It's, it's beyond instinctive. It's planned. It's, it's, a forethought be before the even before there is any growth whatsoever within the basic zygote or the basic uh, original construct of uh, that which is growing there is all the information to have the entire being put together already now you do not you cannot find that within that zygote or and you cannot find that uh message within there but it is there if we have learned that the different layers of the cell have different uh reasonings and things that they are responsible for in creating the body now there are defective cells, there are defective zygotes, and, and sometimes you get uh, malformations and things of that nature because the message is wrong from the very beginning. But the very beginning is that everything is in that original, uh, original combination of sperm and egg, if you're going to put, talk about it as a human. Every, all that information is there. The sperm brings certain information, the egg has the other, the rest of it. And when they come together, it has a, it's like a, um, the, when you cut a tree, there's different layers of, and it shows the age and different things. But in the cell, in that original cell, there's different layers of development that are already uh, uh, programmed in there. And they, and they develop and come out exactly the way they should, the way they are programmed to do by the original contact, by the original uh, creation, if you will, of that cycle. Right. Uh, so we call it blueprint, uh, basically yes. the, the program, three-dimensional holographic program for the body. Yes. And... Um, it's, it is possible that there is a Jungian archetype which exists outside of this dimension uh, that, um, uh, that tells yes. that, that there's a blueprint. So an interesting question is if the blueprint is, is within the cells or is it in other dimensions and the cells just read it from another dimension? The other dimensions, of course, are involved in this but not at the time of conception. It's actually before that. The, the information in the body as the body, before the body was ever made, before you have an orgasm or before the, the actual coming together of the sperm and the egg, 
there has been some uh, fourth dimensional energy affecting every being of every place and time, or whatever kind of energy you want to call it. It's not the energy that you are familiar with. It is not an energy that they, it is able to be measured, but there it is a creative energy that is in and around everything. And that does have something to do with it. So, yeah, I mean, that's a choice. If there is a blueprint create, which is created by the cells, then we can discover it. If it is a blueprint which is in other dimensions, then it's for us it's too early to look for it. We don't have a technology. Well, believe me, you can find it. You see, you can't find it in the ethereal, but you can find the blueprint within the zygote. You, you will be able to find that eventually, uh, but it's too soon for you. But you will be able to find it because of uh, what you're looking for, the sequences of the DNA. Now, there, there's some very, very basic sequences happening when the egg and the sperm meet, uh, some very fundamental things happen immediately. But if you were to witness that and see that, you would see that it's a, it, everything uh, transforms at that time from, it's no longer a sperm and an egg, it is a zygote. It is no longer one or the other, but it's something of a combination of both. And as you have com combined them, they have a different energy because one is a feminine energy and one is a male energy, but they, d they do have a similar energy that has to be there to bring them together, of course. So, but you will be able to note the, there will be a time in your history when you will be able to, to witness that combination and then see a sequence right at, from the very beginning. And that will be very helpful for many. Um, so thinking about the, the shape of the body, uh, I wonder, so uh, the, the dogs, when, they, uh, feed, uh, the, when they're breastfeeding, they have uh, breasts. But then when they are not breastfeeding, the breasts uh, disappear and kind of shrink back to normal. And humans, they have breasts uh, very early and then uh, keep, keep them for the whole life. And then uh, even uh, after they lose the ability to um, give birth, they procreate, they still have breasts, the females. Yeah. I, uh, so I can see the, the practicality of that, but maybe there is some, some supernatural, metaphysical, energetic idea. Why, why, what do they use the breasts for? The males or the females? Oh, female, females. What do they use them when they're not being used? Right. Maybe there is some energetic uh, meaning for that. Maybe they adopted adopted the adopted their existing uh, structure for some uh, energetic purpose. They're there for, uh, in case they are needed. Uh, the, you must understand that the breasts are something that can be, come, come to life when, when necessary. There are times when uh, a, uh, if a child has lost its way or whatever, uh, some breasts can become active to help feed that child. I mean, that's material. I'm thinking about energetic purpose. Maybe that's oh. it's like a telepathic or some other device. Um, no, I, I'm not sure that that is the truth. They are there for distinct purposes, but I don't know if they have any um, altruistic purposes. Okay. So another idea was... Um, that, uh, you know, we are interested in regeneration of uh, bones and restructuring of the body, like if somebody lost uh, some part of the body to recreate it. And uh, humans certainly cannot recreate the limbs, but the um, lizards, some of the small lizards, they, uh, they can recreate their tail, but yeah. not limbs. And some, uh, and many amphibians, especially the, the primitive ones, they can regrow their 
the limbs uh, just fine. So uh, I wonder, um, what does it mean? Well, it's, it was an evolution, necess uh, an evolutionary uh, necessity. There are some uh, creatures that get their legs, uh, that got their legs stuck quite frequently and lost them. And so they have a, uh, a portion of the brain that re is reproductive for these kinds of things. The tail, the leg, the teeth. Um, depending on the living situation of the being, it could be that the tail got stuck a lot, so it was be able to be recreated. Humans have that portion in their brain that have that ability, but they never could, it, it hasn't been um, put to use because it's not necessary. It's not, you don't, humans don't usually you lose an arm, a leg, or a, or a foot, but these, uh, these primitive animals do lose them quite often, and so they're regenerative. Uh, the plants don't have brains, but they also develop pretty complex structures. Yes. So I assume that the structures can be formed even without the use of the brain. Yes, but the yes, that is true. You're absolutely right. But the thing is, the I was just saying the area of the brain that is that humans have for this particular thing is not in you. Not that you need your brain to do that, but it's just, but the humans do have a place in the brain for that. Ah. So when the embryo develops, I think the le the legs develop earlier than the brain. The brain is still pretty much dysfunctional but the legs already grow just fine. I think even it's possible to grow the legs when, when the brain is like undeveloped. It is. The thing is, it was an evolutionary dis, uh, decision that those that were losing their tail all the time should regenerate it. Right. So how can we use it? Is it, uh, how much is it, is it uh, uh, energetic and vibration? Uh, how much is uh, oh, DNA resonance? How much is it used in the regeneration of uh, of the limbs? Oh yes, let me t let me put it this way, and this is very interesting. Instinctively, the the um, instinctively the creature knows that they should have a tail, and it's actually part of their belief system that it should be there. And that is how that the, the DNA is activated to replace it. They believe it should be there, and as they believe it should be there, it reappears. Mm -hmm. which, which is very, uh, very interesting, I think, because that is part of their belief system, and that is how it always has been. Now, the the... The DNA is regenerative because of that belief. That they just absolutely know that they're supposed to have it, and so it returns. The right. DNA creates it. Uh huh. So, you know, I assume the aliens should be able to control that. I think they can. I'm sorry, you're get, I can't hear you very well. I think the aliens should already learn this technology, how to regenerate the limbs and the organs. Oh, yes. So I, I assume it's possible. And I'm, now I'm thinking, how could we do that? Well, so it, one, go ahead. You, you will be able to eventually. Like I said, there's a portion in the brain in humans that can be activated that will help with the regeneration uh, of limbs and uh, different body parts. But mm -hmm. at this point, it's non-active, as most of the brain is. Uh-huh. Right. So we, I, I know there are experiments where people, uh, experimenters, uh, take stem cells and move them um, elsewhere. And when there are stem cells in, in the... Um, 
in the, in the place where the limb was removed or from the lizard, then uh, the lizard grows a new a new uh, leg. So it looks yeah. like uh, it looks like stem cells can recreate the field and can recreate the the necessary structures. Yes, they can. Um, they have the information that they need. Yes. So I'm thinking that we possibly could take some DNA sequences, activate them somehow, and uh, technologically, and recreate the field which is necessary for growing the limb. We just need Absolutely. to know how. Absolutely, you're a hundred percent correct. So how do you find the sequences? That that is well. You see, I cannot without. Uh -huh. I can't just tell you what the sequence are because you just, it's just, uh, how would I tell you? But right. that, the thing is, because you, I can't just say uh, uh, 400, 400 letters or 400 zero ones or whatever to uh -huh. create a sequence for you. It's just, it, they're, they're, the sequences are not uh, simplistic for the right. most part they do carry a great deal, deal of impetus, but you must find a whole, one whole sequence. Once you find one whole sequence, you will find how they work and they will be second nature almost to you. You will be able to find another and another and another because you will be able to mm -hmm. look at that pattern and uh, duplicate it millions of times in many different ways. It's All right. Like after you do the Rubik's Cube once, uh, you can never not do it. So, right. so it's it's just um, I cannot give you the sequence here because I, I don't know which. One. <laughs> right. So I'm thinking about uh, that piece of the uh, that cluster of genes which is responsible for head and tail and everything in between it's a pretty small part of the genome yes and uh, it's it clearly is responsible for the structure so that's interesting yes. but I don't think it can resonate a lot because uh, it's a small part I think for resonation I need a lot of copies of something per uh, person what? For resonation, I think we need a lot of copies of the sequence per cell. Yes. And this cluster is unique and small, so it doesn't seem to be a good candidate for resonation. Exactly. It is more simplistic than you would find in the human body. All right, so I'm, one of the thoughts was maybe it has imprints on other parts of the genome, which are uh, this horse's uh, yeah. homologic, hom homologous uh, resonation sequences, which would resonate with this cluster. It's still a good place to start to learn, because even though it's not a, a the kind of sequence you would find in humans, it will give you an idea of how the sequences work. <laughs> so it's still a good idea to find them, because it will give you clues to the human sequences as well, even though it's not as big or as or complex, it will give you an idea of how it works. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, another idea was um, uh, how to activate those DNA sequences. Suppose we take some candidate DNA sequences and take a model system. Say model system is an embryo, like uh, fish embryos. We can have pretty easily fish embryos in a uh, in test cuvette and we, we take our candidate synthetic synthetic DNA sequences and start activating them and see how they, uh, that affects the embryo. So that's a good, reasonable experiment, easy to do. Oh, absolutely. And that is very a, a very good way to, to, um, to begin. It is a good way to begin. So how do we activate the DNA? One of the ideas was to just shock it with electricity, give it some charge, like electrical, uh, short electrical pulse in the solution. Well, yes and no. Um, 
an electrical shock in the wrong in the wrong way will not do anything. Uh -huh. uh, you have to have it exactly positioned correctly to be at the beginning of the of the, of the uh, sequence. I see. If, if you have it started at the, it won't work right if you shock it and it's and it's not near the beginning. Okay. Another idea was to give it a frequency and just scan all yes. all, all sorts That's of actually frequencies. That's a better idea. Give it a frequency, and uh, because shocking can actually harm the the whole system. But anyway, um, a, a vibration or a frequency is a better idea. It's softer, but yet it is activating, and mm -hmm. they do react better to a soft push rather than a, a harsh one. Um, now I'm thinking about the drugs or devices that contain uh, some DNA sequences, and then these devices are placed, it's more like a patch on, on the skin, and then we activate these DNA sequences with a vibration. Yes, I like that too. Mm -hmm. your, your thought processes are very uh, helpful. That, uh, that will definitely give you some ideas. That is, if you can read the responses properly. Right. Yeah, you I hope be, that, you know, if we do it on animals, we could see the, ch the changes, some changes, and some changes will be positive, and then we can adjust the frequencies and adjust the sequences. Yes, I think that that is good because you'll see the difference in reactions, and I hope you're able to read the, the responses properly. Because if you are able to read the responses properly from these kinds of experiments, you'll be able to learn quite a lot about them, uh, a lot about the sequences. Uh huh. Um, or at least the beginnings of them, uh, or at least the ends of them. It will give you some idea of which direction they are moving and why they're moving that direction. All right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping now the topics. I think I, I exhausted uh, my ideas on the topic of DNA resonance. At least I want to stop here and ask you a simple question. So we, I'm looking at the Egyptian, uh, Egyptian um, uh, pictures, and many of the beings hold the same instrument in their hand, which is like a loop. And then the cross on the loop. Yes. What is it? That's a, um, it's a, a uh, what do they call it? Transporter. Okay, how does it work? Well, the ones that, uh, the ones that are holding that are usually the aliens. Uh -huh. it, it, it's a communication design, device. It's a, it's a, also a computer. Uh, kind of device that's made to look ornamental so that that the people would just see it as an ornament or something but it can uh, it's designed to work with their thought processes and they can think a certain thing and uh, communicate to other places or they can actually transport to other places uh-huh how, if I have one, how would I use it? You would, you would have to have your DNA put into it. Okay. If a human just got a hold of it from one of the aliens, they would not be able to use it at all because their okay. DNA resonance is not in, in, in it. And this is made specifically for the person that is holding it. And so... That is why it's so effective. It's uh, the, many of the transporters that they made before that were very ineffectual because their DNA was not part of the transport porter, and so they would scatter their molecules around. But this uh, will help to keep them all aligned because their their DNA is in the system, so to speak. And it has their exact uh, replication 
um, within it, and so they can transport to another place and turn out whole and pure. Uh-huh. So, um, so it's like a tricorder or something. Uh, very much like, oh, you're talking Star Trek. Um, yeah. Yes, it's a tricorder actually does medical analysis as well. These weren't set up for that, but for transporting and communication. So why is the cross at the end? What, what is the technical meaning of the cross? Oh, it's just a, it's just a, uh, uh, something attractive. Uh-huh. But it what? is, you know, it was a symbol at the time of uh, prosperity and uh, power and things of that nature, it, but it wasn't uh, part of the system. The uh, it wasn't part of the uh, transporter system, really. I see. Uh, what was the name for for that device? The Vesun. 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 Uh huh. Vesun. Thank you. But um, you see, it, it, uh, the Vesun. The name for it did not fit into the Greek language very well because mm -hmm. the Greek language was very harsh in many ways. And when you said it, you didn't pronounce it Vazun on when you were on Earth, it was Vazun. Uh -huh. But in, in the astral, when they were off planet, it was Vazun. But on that, on Earth, it was more Vazun. Okay, thank you much. Um, I, I want to finish the recorded part, which will be published. Do you have anything else to um, to announce for the for the public? No, not really. Just that there are many changes coming your way. Oh, that's nice. Can you elaborate? Uh, many changes are coming to the earth very shortly, but I cannot tell you what they are. All but right. prepare yourself for change in many different ways. So, um, how can you prepare? What's the attitude? Just the attitude is that you know that something is going to happen. You know that it is inevitable. Feel that the future is inevitable. Uh -huh. It is a good thing, and it can be a bad thing, or it could be whatever. But it is inevitable. And the only way to prepare is to know that it's coming. All right. Um, yeah, I see a lot of signs of changes. A lot of what? A, a, a lot of signs of change. Yes, there are. Yeah, the dreams are different. The reality is a little bit different. Yes, there is a change in Earth itself. I see many rainbows. A promise that God will keep. Uh huh. It's the rainbow is actually a covenant that He will sustain life on this planet. Oh, nice. That's nice to know. Um, in terms of personal involvement, um, you know, some people are really much involved in 3D life and some people believe that uh, it's nice to work on yourself and uh, just uh, uplifting your own vibration is sufficient. So what, what is, is uh, are both uh, ideas equal, equally valid? Let me put it this way. Those that discover that, that they have a mission will veer off from a 3D reality and start working on that. Those that do not will work on their 3D lives as best as they can. Now, there will come a point in history where they, that uh, third dimensional and fourth dimensional beings, so to speak, uh, will, will veer off one from another one will move to a different dimension and the other will stay behind because that is what they know the best and that is they cannot they're not prepared for it to move any farther 
so they will stay. Um, but that is about all that I can really give you as an insight. So we expect Blavatsky mentioned that there will be a new root race uh, that that we are evolving into a new root race. Yes, that's true. And and I wonder how do we recognize you know this new race? What's the difference? You will not recognize it because you will not be in the same place to recognize it. What I mean by that is that the new the new root race will be in a different dimension. But there will be a new root race on the third dimension as well. But you, you will not see that, I do not think. The, the time is not yet for that. So the fact that our children are different is not sufficient to recognize them as a new race? Not yet. So what is, um, where, are, where, where are we moving with the children? The children are different. being born of a higher intelligent level than ever before and of a higher consciousness and that will eventually move your planet forward at least that's what we are hoping so the root race will go elsewhere where is it going on on terraha yes okay so what happens to this race it continues Oh gosh, so we have two races now. Well, that has happened with many of those that have ascended. Uh -huh. um, uh, the Eliashon Dizendi, for example, they have divided into two different species. Uh -huh. They were one species at one time, and then one evolved to a higher place than the other. And so they divided. And one species lives one place, and the other lives another. So the new species, would it be different physically? Not necessarily looking much differently, but uh, they do have some different looks, yes, but they are in a different dimension uh, altogether. They have gone to a higher place, a, a greater vibration. Would they sexually be, in, be attractive to us? The Eliashon Dizendi are reptilians. No, no, our species. Our oh, yes, of course. Uh, they, will still look, they will still look very human, yes. Uh-huh. Yes, you would be attracted to anyone on Terra Ha. Yes, not a problem. Nice. Would they still be uh, sexually prolif proliferating, like sexually multiplying? Yes, of course. It, it, they will not change that much. The dimension change will change their uh, vibration and their physicality as far as density, but it will not change their uh, how they procreate or any of that nature. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I... I'm looking at the videos on, on the YouTube and Facebook and many people pop up which look very alien. They still uh, have lots of human features, but they also have some alien vibrations. Yes, there are many aliens here in human form. Right. So that's, that's very interesting. Uh, some of them, I, I assume, are Earth-born. They just kind of have... Uh, alien vibrations and, and others I, I assume they are broadcasting from above or something like that? Well mo many are uh, earth-born aliens meaning that they have such a high proportion of alien in them that they are actually just as much alien as human and there are many of those on earth at this time. All right, I have, uh, I'm, I'm done with the public uh, part. I will stop the, stop the recording and I will ask a few personal questions. I have a few more minutes. All right. Uh, all right, stop it now.